we'd like to start off the session with welcoming our guest speaker for today. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. We're going to have a wonderful one. So, this is our professor. Um, he, okay, he joined uh, the old group, the Joe's Largest Tech Investment House, in 2018, as part of our head of strategic development. Um, he focuses on investor relations, on the service of strategic development across the entire group. Before joining Viola, he did serve as U.S. Ambassador to Costa Rica. We were here to protecting U.S. citizens in Costa Rica, implementing U.S. foreign policy objectives, advancing U.S. commercial interests, and expanding U.S. Costa Rica ties. Prior to the ambassadorship, he just had a deep on business development and client services for an investment manager, a um, $40 billion asset manager. It's also worked previously worked throughout Latin America in strategy, marketing, and operations for Fortune 100 U.S. multinationals including Citibank, PepsiCo, and Procter & Gamble. He began his tech investment career decades ago, working as a senior associate for the early seed stage, VC. Ambassador Haney earned a BS in international economics and an MS with distinction in international business and economy from Georgetown University in the School of Foreign Service, Washington, D.C. Um, he was a recipient for the Brunswick Hannigan Scholarship, the Dean's Award for Academic Excellence and Distinction in Oral Examination at Georgetown University, and is a member of the National Jesuit Honor Society. Speaks Spanish, Portuguese, Hebrew, and conversational French. Vince has served on a number of nonprofit and community boards and placed second in season four of Nancy with the Stars. Big round of applause for that. All right, well, thank you guys. Um, So this is another example. First, apologies um, for the delay. Uh, I think this is a lot more um, immigration reform in the Americas. <coughs> institutions get stopped by mundane things in life. Uh, but it is an honor to be here. But this is esteemed assemblage once again. This will be my fourth time um, testifying in front of the U.S. Senate. Um, twice to get confirmed as U.S. Ambassador and what's actually on this very topic on uh, immigration reform in America. So it's good to be back. And Senator Rubio, it's always a pleasure to see you. <laughs> um, there we go. Thank you. So, um, I don't think you guys could have picked a more timely topic than reforming Latin American immigration policies in the United States. Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, this is a very emotional topic, and we're going to get into some of the reasons why. Uh, my understanding, I did not do this in high school, because I'm old enough that we did not have modeling in high school at the time. I did do it in college at Georgetown. And, um, 
I don't think the rules have changed, so I'm not mistaken. The speakers usually don't give prescriptions of policies. We are here to hopefully help you implement your own policies. So you will not be getting from me um, actual recommendations on what we should do. But I hope we can give you the context on some of the challenges that are being faced by um, our immigration policies in the United States. So we're trying to figure this out. Um, obviously, and I think probably most of you know, that earlier this year, the United States suffered its largest government shutdown in history, 35 days. And it was over this very issue, the issue of our immigration policies and our approach to border security on our southern border in the United States. Um, just this last week, and that's the video I wanted to show you, just this last week, um, President Trump decided to go ahead and sign a uh, continuing resolution to keep the government open. Um, he did this, getting 1.347, I believe is the final number, million dollars for a wall along the southern border. And then at the same time, he plunged the country into a constitutional crisis by declaring a national emergency to go ahead and fund and build the border wall. Um, and so one, you can only look at the headlines today out in the newspapers to realize this topic and this issue is a very real and live issue. Uh, I wanted to share with you though, because I think it's important that we talk not just about the emotion behind this, but really build in the hardcore facts. Everyone can form their own opinion on what the facts mean and how to approach them, but facts are facts. So the first fact would be that the United States has always been a country of immigrants um, and remains so today. Matter of fact, it is the largest immigrant country in the world. Uh, almost 50 million immigrants live in the United States, which represents one in five of the world's international immigrants, or migrants, that live in the United States today. The world's largest migration corridor is the corridor between the United States and Mexico. More people cross that border at migration than any other border in the world, including what we're seeing today happening in Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, and all the parts of the Middle East. Having said that, compared to the other countries that are receiving countries, um, the share of the U.S. population that is foreign-born is relatively modest. If you look at the United States, it's about 14%. Canada is a little over fifth at 22%. Australia is double the United States at 28%. And if you go to somewhere like Qatar or UAE, we're talking almost 90% of the population are immigrants. And the U.S. population, the immigrant population, is not nearly as diverse as in those other countries I just mentioned. As the number one um, country, almost 20 small, a little over one-fourth, 26% of all migrants in the United States are immigrants are from one country, from Mexico. But we also see changing trends. So their trends are changing now. Asia actually is outpacing Latin America as the largest source of immigrants in the United States. Um, and you see the chart, I have a chart that would say that um, starting in the early part of this decade, Asia actually passed. So yeah, so here's the chart I was saying that if you look at the chart, um, back in the early part of this decade, the current decade we're in, 
immigration from Asia surpassed that from Latin America for the first time in United States history. And that's really driven by three distinct points. One is you see the precipitous fall in migration from Mexico. So Mexico used to be the number one sending country to the United States as far as migrants. It has now been surpassed by both China and India, which now send large numbers of people to the United States. Also, an important fact is that unauthorized immigration, some people call it illegal immigration, unauthorized immigrants have dipped to the lowest level in a decade. This started, right, this started really back in 2007-2008, and I have to remind people um, that the Obama administration was the administration that had the largest number of removals in U.S. history. So why this tends to be a very partisan issue in the United States, between Democrats and Republicans, if you actually look at the president that removed more unauthorized migrants in the United States in our history, was under President Obama, um, which irked a lot of his Democratic colleagues. But despite that, and this is one of the this is one of the reasons that it is such a hot button issue in the United States still, is that the percentage of population that are immigrants in the United States has reached an historical record. It was a little, it was about 14% back in the late 19th century, about 1890. Again, it rose right at the beginning of the 20th century in the 1910 census, again, a little over 14%. Today, like I said, we're about at about 14% now, and the projection is, is that as things continue, it's gonna be close to a fifth of the US population by 2060. Now, jump into Latin America, which we're going to talk about. I think it's important to realize that the region, like migration itself, is not monolithic. It's very different. There are different driving factors, different approaches, uh, depending on what we're talking about. If you look at the little chart here on the, I guess it's the right, um, about a little over half of all the migrants today in the United States come from Latin America. So that's important, and that's important because, like I said, it is both an emotional issue as well as a proximity to geography. It should not surprise us that we only share two land borders, one with Canada and one with Mexico. So the fact that half of our migrants come from our southern neighbors should not be that surprising. Within that, Mexico plays a predominantly large role with almost 30% of all U.S. migration from Mexico. Um, but and you'll see in a second, that's changing, that's changed rapidly over the last really 10 years. Um, the Northern Triangle, the Northern Triangle of the countries of Honduras, uh, Guatemala, and El Salvador, um, they are, and I'll see in a second, they represent now about 8% of all migrants into the United States. Southern Central America, we're talking about Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama, who send very little of any migrants to the United States. Um, South America, you're really talking about Venezuela and Brazil. Colombia used to be a very important source as well, um, but that's changed since <coughs> late. And then the Caribbean, Cuba, for historical reasons, um, has been the number one sender of migrants from the Caribbean to the United States, followed by Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The English-speaking Caribbean to a lesser extent, but does exist as well. So, like I said, there's been a change in our number one um, sending country, which is now number three, after India and China, but still number one in Latin America, but not for long. Mexico, you can see, back in the early 2000s, sent almost a million people a year to the United States. That number has been almost on a continuous down decline since about mid 2000s, um, and it really accelerated with the Great Recession. When the Great Recession hit in 2007, 2008, Actually, there's been net um, out migration from the United States back to Mexico. So in today's world, there are more Mexican citizens leaving the United States than there are coming into the United States. Um, but at the same time, the Northern Triangle, those three countries I mentioned, are now approaching to be the largest source of migration to the United States from the region. And in fact, they are the key driver overall of the net migration into the United States. So basically what this says is that on average, over the last eight years, the immigrant population from these three countries grew an average of 25%. Mexico, like I said, we actually have net migration out. And all of the countries around the world total 
So they grew twice as fast as the average of all country semi migrants in the United States. If you look at South America, it's interesting to note that you have, and there are a number of reasons we'll get to why in a second, but you have a country like Brazil, which is a massive country that has grown about 33% in migration over the last, since the beginning of this decade. Colombia, Cuba, and Haiti are about around 20%. Uh, the Dominican Republic, similar to Brazil, is grown by over a third. And then you have the situation with Venezuela, which is about 91%, and it's a very specific reason. It's actually a global crisis happening on our doorstep. So what are the driving forces? Why is this happening? I think it's important, as you consider your policy objectives and your policy prescriptions, to think about what are the key reasons this is happening, and then how you might want to approach it. And there are different, like I said, there are no prescriptions up here, but there are different approaches you can take. <clears throat> Obviously, there's enforcement, and that's where we're talking about the border wall, and we talked about that for a while in the United States, or some kind of border barrier. Um, but there are also other underlying fundamental reasons that are driving the migration toward the United States. One is on a humanitarian standpoint. So the Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, are the most violent places in the world outside of the war zone. So if you were to take Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, um, Sudan, I think there might be one more, off the table, these are the most violent places in the world. And that's saying a lot that this is a thousand miles from our southern border. They have the highest murder rates by far of any, any countries in the world. There's rapid gain activity in all three countries, but especially in El Salvador and Guatemala. And they have low or no institutionalization, meaning that the government bodies do not work. They have not functioned for generations out of these countries. And so as you see the caravans coming up from the region, the vast majority of people in the caravans are people from these two countries. And the vast majority will tell you the primary reason they are leaving their home is because they are not safe. Venezuela is a different situation. Venezuela is facing a complete, we don't like to say this these days, but Venezuela is a failed country. This is one of the best examples in the world of a failed country, probably next to North Korea. Uh, the Venezuelan people are facing starvation, lack of medicine, um, lack of basic goods in general, and this is from a country that has the largest petroleum reserves in the world. Venezuela's migration is a global level crisis. So if you look at all the global level crises today among migration, and they have been in the last five to seven years um, very significant, Venezuela is only surpassed by what we've seen in Syria. So Syria has lost over six million of its people. And I'm not talking about the ones that unfortunately have died in the war, but have been displaced and left their homeland. The next country in the world is Venezuela. Venezuela is at 3 million and growing every day. It surpasses Afghanistan and South Sudan as a migration crisis. And then we have Colombia. Colombia, still, despite the peace efforts from last year, is the longest running war in the hemisphere. And if you take the North Korea, South Korea, um, the fact that the war never ended, it was just armistice. It was one of the longest running wars in the world. It's now been 50 years of ongoing war. It's gotten better in the last three or four years than it had in the previous 40, but that was also a key driver of net migration out of Colombia for decades. On the other end, you have economic factors that also obviously <laughs> draw people to the opportunity back in the United States. What we saw in Brazil, one of the reasons we've seen such an increase in migration from Brazil is twofold. One is native Brazilian migration, that Brazilians who want to come to the United States. The other is that Brazil, if you remember, hosted both the Olympics and the World Cup in the early part of this decade. When it did that, it had a special visa policy that allowed migrants from other parts of the region, especially from the Caribbean, especially from Haiti, to come into the country to do a lot of the manual work that was necessary to build the stadiums, to build the infrastructure around the games, uh, around uh, the football matches. When those ended, coupled with the Great Recession hitting, the economy suffered and really tanked in Brazil, not to mention the political uncertainty that were also surrounding um, what happened as a result of the removal of the president and the jailing of the ex president. Um, and so we have seen those both drivers as net migration of Brazil. 
Haiti is still, despite what's happening in Venezuela, it's still the poorest country in the hemisphere. As of late, in the last month, um, things have gotten really up and bad and worse. It is again um, in civil unrest. In fact, the State Department will probably order uh, in order of departure of all non-essential people and family members out of Haiti sometime later this week. The Dominican Republic, a third of the population lives in poverty. Um, there is a strong foothold of Dominican people in New York. And what happens usually with family immigration is family follows family. Also, the proximity to Puerto Rico, um, both in physical and in cultural, um, allows some Dominicanos to jump the motor passage into Puerto Rico, stay for a little while, and then Puerto Ricans have the new citizens. So they have unfettered access to the United States. And in Cuba, there were two driving forces. There have always been two driving forces. The first one is a US policy that was just changed at the very end of the Obama administration, December 31st, 2016, matter of fact, which was, which was colloquially called the right foot to dry foot policy, that Cuba was the only country in the world that, as a Cuban citizen, as long as I stepped foot on US land, if I was I would, be, I would be given asylum. So if I was interdicted at sea, I would be returned to Cuba. But if I could find my way somehow, either via boats or via the land bridge through Central America into US territory, I automatically get asylum. And then that led to process of provincial citizenship. That was obviously a huge driver for years of Cuban migration. The other one was economic. As the island's economy tanked, more and more people decided that they'd be better off somewhere else. So if you look at both the humanitarian and the economic driving forces, those are some of the underlying fundamental reasons what's driving the migration from the region north. And I don't think that this is playing. What I wanted to play here was a uh, that was referred to myself with the head of appropriations, State Ranger, the congresswoman from Texas. Um, and Henry Cuella, which is a congressman um, man from Texas, she's a Republican, he's a Democrat, who were in Costa Rica at the time in November of 2015 because Costa Rica was facing a migration crisis of its own. About 7,500 Cubans got stuck in Costa Rica. Like I said, they, would use, they were using Central America as a land bridge, as many migrants do. When you think about 7,500 people, you don't think that's a lot, but in a population of 5 million people, Maybe it's the same as saying 400,000 people were amassing at the US border. Um, they, this had been happening for a while. This has been happening for years. The US has known about it. Other countries have known about it. We helped the Costa Ricans take down the human trafficking smuggling ring. And when we did that, one of the unintended consequences of that good action was the fact that the people that were using that ring got stuck. Because as we either arrested or the people went into hiding, the people that were doing trafficking and or smuggling, the people that were using them had nowhere to go and nowhere to get out of the north. Coupled that with the fact that Nicaragua and Costa Rica have always had tense relationships, Nicaragua sent its army to its southern border, Costa Rica's northern border, stationed the army on the border, fired tear gas into Costa Rica, and locked migration down. So all these people that were coming from south to north got stuck in Costa Rica, and the country was overwhelmed. And basically, I'll do the presentation with your eyes, but there was an NPR story, National Public Radio, that came down to Costa Rica to interview a number of us about Costa Rica as a model. Costa Rica has traditionally been an inflow or receiving country. There are more Americans in Costa Rica than there are Costa Ricans in the United States. They don't want to leave their country. It's a great country. I don't understand why they don't want to leave. Um, but it has also served as a safety valve for Nicaraguan immigration. So you look at the immigration within the region for the last few decades, a lot of it has the Northern Triangle. Nicaragua is poorer than those countries in the Northern Triangle, less violence, but poor, has fewer freedoms given this political system, yet Nicaragua does not send many migrants north. And why is that? Because they send the migrants south in Costa Rica. Panama, Costa Rica's southern neighbor, has been the number one recipient of migrants fleeing the violence in Colombia for decades. And now is number two after Colombia for Venezuelans leaving as well. So these countries, unlike others in the region, and maybe with Chile and Uruguay, to a certain extent here as well, 
are actually net receiving countries of migrants. And so any policy that this body would institute, and I spent a lot of time in this body and a lot of time in your sister body in the Congress, speaking with the esteemed bodies here about how our immigration policy can negatively impact, depending on what we decided to do, our most loyal and stable allies in the region. Because if we cut off completely our border, and if we were successful in stopping all migration north, those people, because of the violence they're facing, especially in Northern Triangle, aren't going to stay there anymore. So they're going to go safe. And it's likely if they can't go north anymore, and if I'm a parent and I'm thinking about my children being safe, I'll send them to the next best place, which would be south, which would be Costa Rica. Costa Rica is the last chance for us to stop everything bad from south to north, be it drugs, human trafficking, smuggling, terrorism. Um, Costa Rica is the last country that has functioning institutions in the region and in North. So if we overwhelm a partner like Costa Rica, we're actually probably, at the end of the day, doing more damage to ourselves from a national security perspective. So I spent three years talking about that story. I think we finally got some residents in the Congress as they, this year, uh, finally appropriated a separate, a separate line item in our budget, our national budget, which is approved for Costa Rica. Yeah. So what should our response be? Well, that's up to you guys. The first thing I would suggest though is, what is our objective? What do you want to accomplish with this policy? Do you want to halt unauthorized migration? Is that what we want to do? Is where we're talking about enforcement? Are we talking about building the wall? Are we talking about having asylum seekers stay in Mexico as their cases are adjudicated in the United States, not passing into the United States? Are you thinking about comprehensive immigration reform? Are you thinking about taking this and finally tackling something that the US Congress, both the Senate and the House, have failed to act on for 40 years now? Right? Really, since 1965, when the immigration law in the United States changed, we started to see this large influx of immigrants as we went from a country quota system to a voting system. That was the inflection point. And since then, and everyone knew it would be the inflection point, nothing's been done. Are you talking about DACA? Are you talking about the deferred action? Children that were brought to the United States by their parents, when they were very young in most cases, so you don't have a choice, you're going to your parents but are considered unauthorized immigrants but have lived their entire lives and productive lives by the vast majority in the United States. But legally, are they unauthorized? Or is that, is that, do, you, do you want to deal with that? And then how do you address the fundamental issues of the key drivers here? So maybe you do enforcement. Maybe you think that the response should be strong reporters. What do you do about the underlying fundamental reasons that are driving people out of their countries in our own backyard? Because if we don't address them, it will continue. And as we've seen in many instances around the world, no matter how strong we think our border security is, it's always vulnerable. And there's always some way to get in, out, around, above, or under any wall fence, et cetera. And like I said, you should also take into consideration that anything that we do do will impact neighbors such as Costa Rica and Panama, who are traditional allies in the region with immigration systems that are already overwhelmed because they do take, on a percentage basis, far higher numbers in the United States does of their Latin brethren. But then the question is, should we care? These fundamental issues are not fundamental issues that necessarily affect us on a day-to-day -day basis in the United States, but should we care that they affect other countries? And to make things just a little more interesting, there's a little bit of a context that you'll have to deal with. And I had the opportunity now to meet with many of you, your real life counterparts in the United States Senate, where we talk almost exclusively about this part of the issue. So comprehensive immigration reform, like I said, has a history of failure and a lack of political will because it's hard. It's not something that's easy to do. As I started this, it's emotional. It's a very emotional fact. It's a very emotional issue. So people don't like dealing with it, and it's easy to punt or kick the ball down, the down the street. But it's also become a very partisan issue in many ways. 
So if you go back to two decades in the United States, you have an equal number of Republicans and Democrats saying that border security should be one of the number one ways we address immigration in the United States. The, the Democrats before the President Trump and Republicans were actually advocating for a stronger barrier on our southern border. Because traditionally, the Democratic Party has thought that workers that come from the South take jobs that many people in the United States would traditionally have if they weren't here. That's been proven for many times not to be true, but that was the Democratic belief for decades. So they were actually advocating back in the 80s a strong wall, a full wall of our support. And that has now flipped completely. It is now the Republicans who are advocating for a wall on our border. Um, and, but if you think about immigration as a big issue, in the midterms, polls were done before the midterms that just happened last November, the vast majority of Republicans saw this as a major issue. This was higher or equal to the economy. On the Democratic side, the only thing that was scored as high on the Democrats as the Republicans was public. As far as immigration and unauthorized immigration is concerned, it was not an issue at all on the Democratic Party. The graduate permit status to the DACA kids, overall, the plurality of the United States citizens think it should be done. Overall, the entire country thinks it should be done. But even there, you see there's a difference between how Republicans approach and how Democrats approach. It. And then support for the border wall, which is, like I said, caused us the longest government shutdown in history and has thrown the country into a constitutional crisis. 80% of Republicans favor it. 80% of Democrats oppose it, as do 62% of independents. So you can't think about how to solve this issue without thinking about the political context in which it exists. It's, it is, like I said, probably after healthcare, the most emotional issue you'll find in this politics today. And there's another side to this. Migration, like I said, the US has always been a country of migration. And today it remains still the number the largest immigrant country in the world. And it actually obviously changed the character and nature of who the United States is. And this, especially in the era of populism, is also key on the political context. And what many of you and many of your true your real counterparts are thinking of every day when they have to go about and vote on bills to trust this issue. So, like I said, 1965 was the inflection point for migration in the United States. Prior to 1965, we had country quotas. So every country around the world had a certain number of migrants that we would allow in every year. And you can imagine that the vast majority of those quotas were given to countries in Europe. And very, very few were given to countries in Latin America or Asia. That changed in 65 when it became more needs-based. And things such as the Vietnam War, things such as what we saw going on in the Middle East, things such as we saw going on in Latin America, caused that to change and caused a change in the flows of migrants to the United States. That in turn has completely changed US society. So in 1965, 84% of the United States was white or Caucasian, 84%. If you look at in 2015, that number dropped to 62%. And if, you, and if you project that forward to 2050, there will not be a majority racial group in the United States anymore at all. So we're going to have the white population be about 40%, Asians will be close to 30%, followed by Hispanics and then all white blacks. So the first time since the founding of the country, we will not have majority culture let's say, in the United States. And that has been driven principally by migration. So if you look at, in the second part of the first chart, if you look at the left, if you look at what would the United States look like today if it had not been for the inflection point in 1965, you see a vastly different country. So this is something that's very emotional for people, it's very sensitive for people, and it's not something that, it's something you have to consider in the context when you talk about migration. America. And this is for better or for worse. And I could put a lot of stats on how most immigrants in the United States actually are net positive on every single factor that you can look at to the United States as a country. From job creation, to paying taxes, 
to lower crime rates. But like I said, this is a book. And so you cannot forget in the back of your head that as nation states continue to try to define themselves and who they are and where their place in the world is, that who they are and what they look like and how they feel as a culture is a huge part of that. And so this is changing the way the United States perceives itself. And for some people, that's a great thing. For other people, that's very uncomfortable and unsettling thing. And like I said, the other side, on the right side, Asians are predicted to become the largest immigrant group, surpassing Hispanics, who surpassed blacks in this last decade, in the United States in a couple of years. So the country's going to look much different when your children are around than when they did when I was a child. Because we're talking about three generations changes there. And so that is part of the context of this discussion, and that is really the reason no one has been able to do this comprehensively for the last 40 years. Because addressing these kind of issues, especially in the political context, is not easy, if impossible. <coughs> so, get at it, and good luck. I'm glad I might be back. Uh, Ambassador Haney is willing to do a Q&A, so if you have some questions, raise your hands, please. And uh, Alice, if you were your co-chair, could call on people. I appreciate it. Yes. Would you like to start? Yes. Uh, can I ask you two questions just about Colombia specifically? So first off, what's the ongoing uh, war that's happening in Colombia? So Colombia had traditionally had a number of guerrilla movements. Um, the biggest one, the last president, uh, only they actually negotiated with two years ago. The current one is a much smaller faction, uh, the ELN, which is also President El Salvador, uh, but it still exists. So this was a guerrilla movement that started really around the revolution after the Cuban Revolution, and as the left became resurgent in Latin America, tried to get a foothold in Colombia as well. And Colombia fought, like I said, a four-decade war against that insurgent movement. It was very bloody. It was very violent. Um, I mean, things were going up in the capital city, Bogota. Um, it was a country that was on the top list of not to go to for decades. Um, things are, like I said, are a lot better now. That's coupled with the fact that you have a narco economy that is massive. And that's an issue that I did not put up here. But uh, Colombia, for many reasons, and one of them is for it because of the peace plan that was negotiated, has stopped doing a lot of the eradication of this coca. coca. So it is now producing record numbers of coca, which is coca leaf, which produces cocaine, and flooding the markets, the world markets, are being flooded with additional drugs. All that violence is endemic to the society, and so that was one of the key issues for driving people up. My second question is, uh, would you say that Colombia is still feeling major attacks from uh, Pablo Escobar's drug empire? Um, not from Escobar's, but from the drug empires in general, yes. I, it doesn't matter who's the top. We'll see this in the United States with Chapo as well. Chapo was just convicted. <coughs> because the fundamental organization still exists. And there was in the United States government for a long time an argument about what we call convergence between terrorism and narco trafficking. And those of us, including myself, and General Kelly, who then became head of Homeland Security and became chief of staff, were under the impression that these are businesses, these are global enterprises. And I, as a global business person, will want to maximize my profit. And I have what I have is amazing distribution. And so if Escobar's is ahead of it, or Chapo's ahead of it in Mexico, or the Sinaloa cartels, what that matters is the local violence that it produces within those countries as people fight for dominance. But at the end of the day, if you remove the head, it's like removing the CEO of a company. There will be other people that will rise to the top. And as long as that distribution network's not disturbed, the, the, those goods, whatever goods they may be, humans, drugs, terror, will be shipped through those distribution systems. So all the countries within the region are still suffering from what the United States has now acknowledged after many tortured years as a fundamental US issue which is the U.S. consumption of drugs, which therefore derives, it's a market. So it derives the production of drugs, the growing cultivation, production of drugs, and things around that, and our neighbors to the south. Thank you. Any more questions? Let's have a conversation. If America does build a southern border wall, won't uh, southern, southern Americans or any other immigrants that wants to come in 
overstay their visas or have other ways to come in? Uh, they do. It is much harder these days to get a even a non immigrant visa in the United States than it was some years ago, number one. Um, but the overstay of the visa is a huge issue. It always has to be in the United States. Um, that is not trying to be addressed, but the way that that's been addressed on the State Department, and this started under the last administration, really is to make it that much more difficult to get a visa to begin with, much more stringent. So if anybody, if there's any inclination that someone might overstay their visa, they're likely not to get it. Um, so that will, that's always been an issue, that will continue to be an issue, but it's, it pales in comparison to the unauthorized immigration across the land. So that's why the walls are such a hot topic. Okay, I know we're not supposed to, like, you're not supposed to talk about your policy, but I honestly am curious to know, do you think taking America's resources and putting it into these countries, okay, because as you said, a lot of problems are economic or like the war, you said it's ongoing, it's only for, for decades. Do you think maybe instead of putting resources to block immigrants or help immigrants, just of the actual countries that they're coming. Do you think that's a valid option? So that's been a topic of debate for a long time. Um, and the United States has a very checkered history in Latin America. Uh, a lot of what the country's ills, the, the ills the country are facing today, despite the drugs aside, yeah. were politically induced by the United States back in the 50s. Um, I think we've owned up to that now. I think that's admitted so it's no longer debatable. But the question is, is how much positive influence can we have? We have a lot. Unlike in other regions of the world, we still, I mean, being U.S. ambassador in Latin America still means something. It doesn't mean well. But being U.S. ambassador in Latin America still means something. And the reason is, is the United States still has such a big influence. Um, when we saw the initial caravans back in 2014 arriving on the border, which surprised everybody, um, and the entire Washington D.C. establishment flew into frenzy. The State Department came up with a aid package to the Northern Triangle that was about a billion dollars, tied to certain things those countries had to do. For example, Guatemala has set up a corruption resource at this point. Guatemala is now being dismantled in this. Uh, with the UN, a corruption uh, inquiry into because the problem has always been. Without the institutionalization in place, the resources the United States has, and it's been a lot over the years, from the USAID, from the State Department, military, from security, um, poured into these countries just disappears. Disappears into the pockets of officials, disappears into offshore accounts, does not benefit the people, um, and the situation continues to deteriorate, not improve at all. So then the question becomes your, your question, and the, the answer is. Fundamentally, as we have seen, I think, with the migrant crisis around the world, if you do not address the fundamental issues, um, I would ask this question when I had to testify in front of the Senate. I would, I would turn it back, and I, and like I did there, and I said, Look, I have four kids. I, as a parent, living in Northern China, I'm in Honduras, and my choice is to send one of my daughters, 11 years old, by herself on a thousand mile journey. With this person who somebody told me might be good to get her into the United States, knowing full well that it's likely that she's not going to get there in the same condition she left home in, and all the horrible things that happened to her. Imagine the agony a parent has to go through to say, I'm going to do that anyway, because it's probably better for her if she makes it than staying at home. So when you have a fundamental question of that, and you put on that human level, without saying policy prescriptions, if you don't address the fundamental issues, the rationale of what's driving these people out of other countries, they will continue to leave. They just yeah. uh, You said that uh, eventually immigration is a good thing for the U.S., but we get to sign Europe where immigration is rapid, but we saw uh, higher crime rates and overpopulation. Why is the U.S. any different? Uh, the U.S. for one thing, like immigration, since such like it's been such a long time of our history, um, this is not it's nothing new. Like since the highest point in immigration in the United States was back in 1890, um, and 
We are the largest migrant country in the world, a country of, of international in the world. So the United States has had a very, a fairly good system of trying to integrate migrants into the culture, into the society, into the economy. Um, and that's powered the growth of a country that has just expanded tremendously since the 1860s. And you have to think of what the United States economy was based upon up until about 1860 was it was a slave economy. So it was forced labor. And that was really the driving impetus behind a lot of the growth of the United States in the early part of the 19th century. And that's what the Civil War was, in a lot of ways, was about. It wasn't as human rights were very important, but in enshrining our Constitution was the fact that we did not value people equally. So it could have been predominantly the reason we did things. But the economy was based upon a cheap labor source. As that cheap labor source started to dwindle, and as the United States continued to expand, and you had all this land west, especially the Mississippi, migration fed into that. So migration fed into both cheaper labor and actually just people on the ground, people actually to farm, till, occupy, sit in this land. And so from the United States perspective, it's very different from the European perspective that countries have been around thousands of years with limited resources, limited economies, limited space, you had a very open opportunity set in the United States. And so migration fed into it. Um, and it has traditionally over time. And so I think the rationale of the long-term migrants in the United States, and why they've been in that positive is because of that. Have there been issues, especially as of late, where there have been negative instances without a doubt? No, always will be. Um, especially from the Northern Triangle, especially from the gang perspective, it is an issue. It's an issue that the FBI and Homeland Security is aware of now for about two decades. But you have fundamental gangs who operate like quasi states coming from the Northern Triangle into the United States, and that has been a negative um, because it also then does things in the community, established community already in the United States. In the United States. So overall, all, like I said, I didn't put them up there, but if you just Google online, you can find from everyone from the Cato Institute, which seems to be much more libertarian, <laughs> heritage foundations is much more clean, to Perkins, to all these to Pew, to all these research institutions that all come to the same basic conclusion. They kind of say it differently, but that migrants have added positively to the fabric and the economy of the United States over the last 10 years is industry. What we do about where we are today is what we Again, that's a policy question. Um, they, um, you know, it's, it, but it is, it is, a, it is a very, good, it's a very good question. Um, it is one that is just a fundamental who the United States wants to be as a country, um, and where we want to put our resources. And given the problems the United States has itself, for those resources we better spend trying to invest in the United States, or. Because of the moral leadership role the United States has tried to traditionally play in the world, is there a requirement that the United States stand up and say, you know, we will raise our hand to some of these refugees? One of the things I did in Costa Rica was institute with Costa Rica the first TPA, Temporary Protection Agreement, um, in the Western Hemisphere for refugees. Um, so trying to take some of the strain off of the United States to work with the Costa Rican government to say those who are really, I mean, the UN can demonstrate are in, in imminent danger in the Northern Triangle. Instead of them having to get to the United States in the Mexican border and wait there and maybe get in and not get in, can we pre qualify some of these really severe cases? Um, and there are some really horrific cases in the Northern Triangle. And have Costa Rica to really host them whether applications for asylum are, are adjudicated, both the United States as well as other countries, so Canada, Australia, and some of the other countries. And so we actually got that in place with the Costa Rican government, which is the in this hemisphere, trying to kind of walk that fine line, saying that, yes, the United States has a role and has a duty to try to help and seize this kind of thing with our model world, 
but the United States doesn't have to be the receiving country for all these people. There are other ways that we can step in with our resources and help one of our partners like Costa Rica, who has a very strong um, migration system. The UN votes is one of the strongest, if not the strongest, of us in the One of the strong migration systems can help them with resources, money, people, education, whatever they need to continue to bolster their migration system with the in benefit being the United States, that people that go to the United States don't go there and they go to Costa Rica while they wait, find out where they're going to go around the world. So there are about three of those agreements around the world. Um, and so that right now is kind of an open experiment around is that fine line the United States can walk? So when we do both, I think it's an open question. Um, I wanted to ask you, you talked earlier about um, the U.S. owning up to its history of interfering in uh, Latin America. I'd like to hear more about that. Um, what responsibility it has taken, how the struggles it has taken in owning up to it, where? Wow. Um, that's a whole history class. Yeah. Um, the United States was traditionally, because of the Monroe Doctrine, kind of divided the world into two. Um, and what we're seeing in the United States for isolationism is nothing new. The United States, for long periods of its history, was very fortunate to have oceans on both sides, uh, and by far be the strongest country in its neighborhood. Uh, and so the idea that problems that happen elsewhere, on either side of the ocean, are problems for other people to deal with, um, isn't a new 2016 idea. This has been a strong strain throughout this one policy. It was policy discussions for centuries ago. Should we, should we get involved in World War I? Should we get involved in World War II? Should we get involved in Korea? What are we doing in Vietnam? Why are we, you know, we engaged in the Middle East? It, you could just, Latin America's always been different. And part of it is because of the proximity. It's the only place where you can literally, and people have done this, walk from one tip to the next. And so, that history has always been a little bit different. You also have to remember that a lot of what is the western part of the United States used to be Mexico. So in the war of the United States took half of Mexico's territory. Uh, and that started a proactive engagement in the region that continued for the next hundred years. And so the United States seeing its interests at play within the region, but therefore because it could, and it felt because of national security, had to intervene in places that were a lot easier than if you had to intervene in Austria, just in the country. Um, and so that goes from supporting, it also seemed at the time when it really happened back in the 50s, that during the world was really split into two, between the Soviet Union and the United States. And so everything was seen in that prison, everything. And so if somebody like a Fidel Castro started to move a little too far to the left. Fidel was fine. No one was out, no one liked Batista and Cuba. It's like no one was a, he's a great guy, he's fantastic, he's a you know, Democrat with a big D, he's forced people, no one thought that. Um, but he was considered our guy because his value system, our ability to control that value system was similar enough that we didn't feel threatened. As Cash was starting to move left, and it became very evident that he was gonna find himself, that was a threat. It was 90 miles from our shore, an outpost of who we saw as an existential threat to our existence in the world, which is the Soviet Union. So everything was seen in that prison. So any time you had that working within Latin America, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Uruguay, Chile, I mean, over and over and over, the Dominican Republic, the United States would intervene. Panama, um, and that intervention was usually military, and it's because we could. What we saw as part of the larger existential battle going out of the world. Um, like I said, that is history that I think, as of President Bush won, is, is fairly acknowledged and sold in all of it. Doesn't mean that there's a legacy there that we still have to work through, and we're working through, but it's a lot better now than it was in the 20, 30 years ago. Um, so I was thinking about that you can put the contract under uh, emergency status only when it's in immediate 
fishing that's going on. And I, don't, and I can't understand how Trump puts uh, the, the contract or uh, an emergency status about a thing that doesn't seem to affect the media for the state. Well, I think that's going to be the constitutional challenge, which is the, emergency, the National Emergency Act, which was passed back in 1976, was traditionally had, but it's been used 12 times by President Obama, 13 times by President Bush, and more times by President Clinton. Um, but usually it was for things like natural disasters, um, things like the Iran um, hostage situation, um, yeah, 9-11, yeah, things of that nature. Um, but the actual statute, the actual law that gives the president that ability is not defined. And so the president has the large discretion to declare what he or she thinks is an emergency. And so that's what President Trump's relying on, is saying, I have the discretion as a leader of this country to say, I think this is an emergency, this is something that's imminently dangerous to our national security, one shape, form, or way. He's taking that stance, that's going to be his opinion. There's going to be a lot of pushback on both sides. Um, it will get tied up in courts. I think even his press conference is absolutely right. He will be the ninth district. He will lose. He will lose on the court and will go to the Supreme Court. And then we'll have to see. We'll have to see what ends up happening. Um, but that was all, as much about politics as it was about anything else. If this was truly a national emergency, then one would hope that the President of the United States would have acted upon this from day one, not waited to day 780 in his presidency to address it. Um, but we'll see. General, um, there's a recognition within the US policy circles, regardless of, of what side. I mean, in, the, in the large centers, I think both on the far left and the far right, it's not the case, that there is a recognition that we have played a large role in the development of some of the challenges that our neighbors in the South are facing. Um, those challenges be the political institutions, institutionalization of the law, or most recently, the drug trade. Um, and so I think we have kind of raised our hands and said, yes, we have to play a part in this. Now what do we do about it? That's, that's, that's the bigger question. So if you look back, even to the beginning of President Obama's administration, there was not a readiness, either at the National Security Council or the State Department, to talk about drug flow and narcotics <coughs> as a U.S.-centric issue. It was always the countries that stop aren't doing enough to stop the cultivation of drugs. They're not doing enough to bolster their legal systems to deal with this, and they're too corrupt. Very little at the beginning of the Obama administration was a recognition of, well, maybe the U.S. demand is fueling a market which is too lucrative for people with no other options not to participate in. That changed, and that change has continued under the Trump administration. So I think there is a recognition large swaths of the U.S., at least the policy, I'm not so sure about the public yet, but the policy side, that yes, the U.S. does have responsibility. Uh, but then the question is what the Senate and the House struggle every day, which is, okay, even if we do, what do we do about it? How do we address that? Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming and dedicating the time to the guest. I'd like to ask, if I may, what brings to the job? No, first of all, I'm going to Israel. Um, this is my third time living here. Um, I took a sabbatical, I was living in Mexico at the time, I took a sabbatical back in the late 90s um, and moved here what I thought would be a year. Ended up being my wife here, ended up making Aliyah, um, and living here for a number of years before going back to the States, before moving back to Israel, before I got the call to go to be ambassador in Israel. So this is our third time living here. 
So right now I, I am back in what I used to do pre ambassador stage, which is um, venture capital. That's a great place to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> From Chicago. Um, I would like to ask that uh, immigration is very beneficial to the U.S. to fulfill its basic value, also to save immigrants from horrible lives. But there are so many immigrants coming, and most of them have no education, so they can't make access to work. So, in your opinion, sorry for the policy question, is it possible for the U.S. to accept them and assist them in so there's no doubt, and I didn't put these charts on here, I debated it. There's no doubt that if you look at immigration by education level, you're 100% right. The more educated you are, the larger contribution you end up making to society. That holds true in any country, not just the United States. Um, as far as the tax question, it actually isn't true. Most unauthorized migrants, even those that are at the, at the lowest levels on the economic scales end up paying taxes. They do that because it is a way to show, it has in the past weeks, um, a way to show an affiliation to their adopted country. And so when you want to try to regularize your immigration situation, if you can show you've been paying taxes for seven, eight, nine, ten years without receiving any benefits, very few benefits because you can't, you have to walk in and say, hey, you know, I want my, this, that, or the other. Um, it was seen as a positive. And because of the laws of the United States, the Social Security, the IRS and the Social Security Administration could not share data <coughs> with Homeland Security. So I could even have a false Social Security number that I bought off somebody. And I could be, which is legal, and I could be paying my taxes as an unauthorized migrant, which is illegal. And those two parts of the government could not share my information with the authorities that could deport me. And so actually the vast majority of unauthorized migrants over time in the United States have paid taxes actually. Um, but there is no doubt that it's in the education it is a huge influence on how much you can continue to contribute. Um, and then the question is, and this is the debate and always is in almost any society. Um, are there productive ways that these migrants can contribute to the country? And if there are, which we've seen there are, are they then precluding other US citizens from being productive in that manner? The vast majority of studies will say no. There are studies out there that say yes, because if a migrant comes and takes a job that could have gotten somebody else, a negative influence is unemployment in the United States. The vast majority of studies reject that and say that these are jobs that were always available, that the vast majority of people looking for job in the United States do not want to take because they have other ways to access benefits that a migrant doesn't. So if I have a choice between working 60 hours in a hot sun picking fruit in California, for example, for minimum wage, or as a US citizen, I can walk in and say, I'm going to get my benefits of duty. The Social Security Administration, and the Family Welfare Administration, which one am I likely to do? And traditionally, what we've seen is that most people are likely to say, I'm not going to do this because I'll just back there and work in California heat, and I can get the same amount of benefits, if not more, because I'm a US citizen. So that's still an open question, but it's a very valid one. And the sentiment out there, without a doubt, exists that yes, that's true.
no matter if they are legally unauthorized, legally, temporarily, it does not matter. You become a US citizen. Um, and importantly, that citizenship can transfer to your offspring as well going forward. Uh, that has always been because the United States has always needed migrants, because I said what I talked about earlier has always been a net receiver. Um, that has been a policy that's done well for the United States over the last 10 years. Years. Um, the phenomenon you're talking about is colloquially called anchor babies. Um, and the question is how many people are actually end up doing that? Number one. Um, number two, because there has been more awareness of that as of late, for example, there was a recent case um, where some of the tour operators from China um, have been um, indicted because they were providing birth tours, basically getting women here on the false pretenses saying how pregnant they really were, just give birth in the United States. Um, so the answer is, that's our law right now. Should that be our law? That's a question that the US Senate and the US House have to determine. But as of right now, that's, that's completely legal. Can I ask another question? So uh, just, I, from what I've read from the cabinet, Legal immigration costs the U.S. a lot of money, correct? It depends on how you define it. As um, in like having to deal with um, rapists, drug dealers, people who just come in and call other people, all of those things. The money it takes to deal with them and the money it takes to manage them and replace everything that they've done, it's a lot from what I've seen. Um, if you look at any independent, like I said, if you look at any of the institutes I mentioned before, from the far right to the far left, the actual statistics on crime committed by a migrant population are always lower than the crimes committed by the native population. Always. Now, which is true. That does not mean, though, and I think this is where the question comes in, it does not mean, though, that, okay, if I am born in the United States, I'm a citizen, I commit a crime, then yes, it's horrible, and, but I have certain rights as a citizen, and the government needs to either put me in jail and pay for that, do whatever it is, has to pay for my public defender, because I'm a citizen. If I come in from the outside, I'm not a citizen, and I do the same thing, then that's additional cost to the United States. And so I think that's where the debate has focused. I think what you'll see is the vast majority of unauthorized migrants from the United States, and definitely the vast majority of legal migrants in the United States, or authorized migrants in the United States, commit very few crimes. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, doesn't mean it's not horrific when it's a very serious crime. It doesn't mean that there needs to be a way for the United States to deal with that. Um, again, as of right now, the only way that we deal with that, and it seems to be the right way forever, is the fact that there are certain inalienable rights in the United States. And if you're here, we're going to treat you to a certain extent, depending on what you're charged with, as if you were a citizen as well, because it's very difficult. In the country migrants. And we've seen instances of this. Um, not too long ago, there were two women who were crossing the border from Canada into Montana. Um, and they were speaking Spanish to each other. And a border police agent came up to them and demanded their papers, no matter where they were from. And one was born in California and one was born in Florida. And that wasn't good enough for him because they were speaking Spanish. Um, and now it's actually a court case against the um, Customs Border Patrol. So it becomes very difficult for country migrants not to have an even handed policy and how to deal with things like crime. Because then it becomes up to the individual agent in the field or actor in the field to adjudicate are you a citizen or are you not a citizen? How should I treat you? So the fallback has always been we're going to have a certain level of treatment we're going with and move forward from there. If we want to change that, I think also the cost involved needs to be considered of the technology that would be needed to be available for a person in the field to say, oh, you are a citizen, let me check. Do you need a national ID card? You don't have one in the United States. There's no national ID system. So does one need to be implemented then if we're going to start trying to as you get on the street level, if somebody says, yes or no, that's a huge cost. The technology around that, the training around that, 
how do I deal with this? How would I, as a Torah personal agent who doesn't speak Spanish, understand that these women really were from California and Florida and that lots of the population in the United States is like the third largest Spanish speaking country in the world? So there's additional costs that would have to be considered if we were to start to differentiate between US citizens and unauthorized migrants at the criminal level. I'm not saying that it can't be done. I'm not saying there's not a cost involved, like you said, today, but then we also have to consider what costs would have to be involved to rectify the situation or something. countries uh, in with like um, natural resources, but a few years back it signed a, a thing with the US that they sell petrol for like really cheap. So do you think they're responsible for sorry for the question? Uh, do you think that the US should take responsibility for the crisis uh, in Venezuela or that Venezuela is responsible for the thing that she's yeah, no, I, this is an easy policy question for me, in my opinion, but also the opinion of both the Obama administration and the Trump administration, I think we'll put it back to be similar. Uh, Venezuela is in crisis only because of Venezuela. There's a policy that the Venezuelan government over the last two decades has pursued, which has led it from being one of the richest countries in the hemisphere, and one with the largest petroleum reserves in the world, to now being second to Haiti as the poorest country in the world. And it's people living in abject poverty and misery. And the only people responsible for that are the Venezuelan leadership. Um, the fact that Venezuela had or signed a few years back PDPSA, the oil company, an agreement with the US refineries to refine its oil is also because the governments of the last two leaders of Venezuela did not do the capital investment necessary to keep up the equipment and the capability of extracting Venezuela oil. And Venezuela oil, although it's a lot of it, is not very high quality. So it takes a lot of additional investment to refine it. And there are very few people who do that around the world, and that's just going to be one of them. So had Venezuela continued on the path of investing and upgrading its technology in its own extraction and oil capabilities, it would have been in a different position to sign that. Uh, but I don't think we as a country can force a private enterprise like the oil company to say you have to do the social good because they are not doing what they should do for their own people. So it's horrible, but they put themselves in a position where they needed to have money for the basic things that didn't go to the people anyway, and usually it's the military and their pockets and leadership. Um, so yeah, I mean, Venezuela is unfortunately, it has been for a while, the worst failure um, in our hemisphere as far as our worst democracy and our approach to how to deal with a country that doesn't want to be put in large or whatever the that is. Um, and then the question. Between 14 million unauthorized migrants from the United States. And one of the reasons we never had comprehensive migration reform is because the question of how do you deal with those people? Um, people that do have real asylum cases that want to come to the United States, there is a very detailed process and procedure on how to do that. It's been our own failure of our own system that we have created what we have created in the United States. So traditionally, if I show up at the United States Court of Entry and I claim asylum, it's very hard, again, at that field agent level, for that person to decide you have a credible threat or you don't have a credible threat. So there are like five categories of credible threat you have to have. If you can fit into one of those categories by US law, you have to have the opportunity then to apply for asylum for protection. 
traditionally, what the law also says is your case needs to be, be needs to be adjudicated or taken care of very quickly, and that has traditionally been allowed in three days. I would challenge anybody in the last 10 to 15 years to find somebody whose case has been done in three days. Three years, not a problem. And maybe even then it's a question, but three days, definitely not. So traditionally what we've had is you come in, we think there might be some legitimacy to your fear for your survival if you were to be shipped back to your country of origin. We don't know. That has to be investigated. And that's part of the process. You have to appear in front of a judge. So you get a little tidbit. You appear in front of a judge in six months. Maybe, if you're lucky. Maybe a year. Maybe 18 months. Maybe nothing, and they just say, how can we beat you, literally. And then you're led into the United States. So in that time, over those 18 months, what happens? It's like in the other, in the white society, you start, you're not going to sit there and not do anything for 18 months, you have to live. You get very little help because you're not living in the country, you're in a social status, so you have to go and find a job. So already, if you find a job, and you don't have the kind of work, it's a yard break in your own life, but you have to eat. You end up, you fall in love, you get married, you have kids, whatever it is, your life continues to go on as you wait for our process to go forward. And so four or five years down the line, you probably get in front of the judge, you may have had a whole job now for four years, you may have ties to an established community, you may have children that are now born in the United States and are citizens. And so then as you appear in front of the judge to adjudicate a case from four or five years ago, what do we do? And how do we handle that? We say, your kids are U.S. citizens, and they can say because they have a right, but you aren't, and you need to go. So you either leave your kids here, and you go back to your country, or you take your kids who have been to your country back with you, even though they're U.S. citizens. Really. It's up to you. They can say you can't, you have to do. So how do we deal with this? So our own inability to process through our own laws has created this huge backlog system, which keeps people in limbo, and you can't get people not to do things like have food to eat. So they have to work. So we are forcing them to do things on a daily basis to survive because we, our systems fail. We have not invested what we need to invest on our own state of law to say, okay, I'm gonna have enough judges at the border. I'm gonna adjudicate these cases in three days. I'm gonna have places where these people can stay temporarily for up to a week that aren't cages, but are comfortable and safe and then within a week, if I could tell you that, yes, I would do your case, you have to go back, you have to go back. We, we failed to do that. And so we have created an underground or under in the shadows parallel society ourselves because we have not lived up to our own laws in a way. So then the question is, what do you do with those people that did try to run a huge backlog? What do you do with all unauthorized migrants that have been here for decades in the United States? Do you make them go back and back in line? I think you should. And so that's the challenge around companies at the form. Because if you can't move the system forward, well, most people decide it's like it's too complicated, I don't, I don't want to touch it. And it's just because as soon as you start to unravel one part, the whole ball of you know a thread starts to unravel. And you're very difficult and very messy and very expensive. And then you go back to somebody else's question, which is like, well, why should we spend these resources here when we have so many other problems in the United States that we have to be focusing on? And as a political body, the United States Senate and the House have to answer to its own constituents, the people that elected them. If you come from the state, North Dakota, where you are not impacted on a daily basis by this issue, but you are impacted on a daily basis by your constituents trying to improve their lives for them and their kids, things like healthcare and education, this whole debate becomes crazy to you, which is we're taking US taxpayer dollars to deal with the problem that we should have to deal with. And so that's the emotion and that's the difficulty in doing something comprehensive, which is why it's never been done. Not that it can't be done, but it just has never been done. Are there any other questions? Yes, Bas. Um, do you think that there is a connection between um, unemployed um, illegal immigrants to the rate of crime that illegal immigrants are committing? Or yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think the rate of crime that the unauthorized migrant population commits is lower than the native-born population. So I don't, I don't necessarily think so. I think that um, you have people that face difficult situations differently. 
and they have native foreign people who could also be out working, and they were out working, but decided to commit a crime for X or Y reason. And see, the same thing with the unauthorized market population. Um, I do think if you put people in desperate situations where I can't work, so I can't feed myself or my family. If there is a student who is looking for a blue bag, it's in the control room. A blue bag is in the control room. Thank you. Um, so yes, I think if you put people in desperate situations, they will take up desperate measures. Um, so it's possible. Okay. Um, thank you, delegates. We will not be entertaining any more questions. So after we thank our guests. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs>